Do you know it's EU regulation that an office share must have a five star base? Go away. Yeah. Welcome back to Sikistan, a ministry of disinformation. I mean, um, dissemination of information. Propaganda. No, oh yeah. So, back to the good old fashioned paper reviews. So, today we're doing. So, last week we did the uh, paper review, which wasn't really science, but it was kind of science, but it was like a look at science, who pretended to be science. And it was a nice intro back yeah. into the next season of paper reviews. Today is good old fashioned science. Today's a great paper, a very, very interesting one. It's titled Transfer Effect of Short Term Optimum, or Opium, if you read that wrong, uh, Power Low Training and the Punching Impact of Elite Boxers. Opium training could be very effective. It could be really good for endurance, I'd say, yeah. if you could motivate yourself. Oh, yeah. So this is coming at us from Brazil. It is coming from Sao Paulo, uh, Brazil Boxing Conference, Research Center for High Performance Sports, Catholic University of Merrick. Marcia, Spain, God. Uh, some little bit of contribution from Auckland, New Zealand, great sports science in New Zealand, Australia, typically a little bit from the medical and health sciences in part Australia, but primarily the athletes are from Brazil. So very, very diverse range of people involved in this test. Long story short, a quick synopsis of what the paper wanted to do was they had uh, high level athletes from the Brazilian national team. They had eight of them. They wanted to see how fast could a training effect take place on a sport specific movement so basically how fast could some movements in the gym so in this case they had a bench press half squat and jump squat in the spin machine how fast could these movements when they're loaded in one week how fast and how significant or would there be a significant Im- impact on these boxers punching power so that's what the primary they're looking at and they went about some good science we were pretty we liked this yeah. paper in fairness from the get-go you can see it's kind of not easy reading would be the wrong word for it clear concise what i really like to see is in the introduction and some of the discussion was their reasonings for why they didn't do some stuff now some of that stuff will be clear to you when you're reading it but it's interesting when they give out the reasonings of why they didn't do this so one of the things they did want to do for example was with the transference effect coefficient when you're calculating it you don't want to be practicing the measurement so in this case the measurement was punching power so they only had one week so the boxers did no punching this week because otherwise you would have some kind of interference effect or you would have some kind of uh, additional stressor which could contribute or not so you can't say for sure if the punching then would have any impact on your testing so that's what they did in one week and that's why i wanted to see would this have a positive impact? So I'm just going to give you a quick rundown of the methods. Fitz is going to go over the results, and then we'll do the discussione, discussions at the end. So uh, very, very, very nice little figure one here going over what has happened in the paper. Nice and concise. You don't often see this in papers, so it's great to see, and it's very handy for a video like this. So what we had was we had eight Brazilian boxers on the national team. They were in the National Training Center, and they were tested in the one week so multiple pan american world champions championship competitors involved so quite a high level athletes which is great to see most of the time for most testing so what we had monday to friday we had monday physical tests so they were punching impact and their bar power outputs were done and this was repeated again on friday so what they did for their punching impact was a punching device a newton measuring meter was mounted to the wall and then they tested this through set distances so everyone did the same distance and then they did self select the distance just to see was there any bias because obviously all of these eight athletes aren't going to have the same punching length anatomy and biomechanics and so forth so it was good to get both of those which was quite a little nice little nuance yeah. someone understood boxing there I would imagine uh, so they did that on the Monday and the Friday then Tuesday Wednesday and Thursday all they did was these three sessions they didn't do any other boxing training in between this so on Monday or sorry Tuesday Session one, six by six bench press, six by six half squat, and six by six jump squat. Session two, all these move to five by five. This is on the Wednesday. On the Thursday, all these move to four by four. So on Thursday, four by four bench press, four by four half squat, four by four jump squat. So in the punching, like we said, they measured it on a uh, force reading meter on the wall. And then on the power output, they were in a Smith machine. Uh, so obviously in the half squat they would have used a uh, floor a force plate on the ground which any sports science student will have seen at least some point in your degree and then in the bar power out of it they would have had different re- reading meters you don't really particularly need to know those but you just need to know that they recorded those that was it basically long story short they did the, the intervention they did their training they didn't do any other punching their sleep and nutrition was controlled or consist or made consistent essentially and then we got our results 
So what results did they get, Fitz? So the results they got were actually quite interesting, right? If you look at the three things they looked at, uh, half squat, jump squat, and bench press, what we see is possible... If <laughs> Carry on. No, no, continue. We see possible to probable uh, increase in outputs for half squat and jump squat. So it looks like over the course of three sessions, going from Monday to Friday, they had a meaningful change for the half squat and the jump squat. In the case of the bench press, there was... Uh, no meaningful change for bench press over the course of those three sessions. So from Monday to Friday, their bench press values didn't change or alter at all. And we're probably going to talk a small bit more about that in the discussion. What does this mean then? Did their, like, so if they're after increasing their power outputs, were they after increasing their punching power? Well, you had possible to probable increases in four distinct punch types. Uh, going from the Monday to the Friday, it's important to reiterate again that they did no punching in this time. And then we get a transfer effect coefficient between the bar outputs and the half squat and jump squats, but not between the punching. So, or sorry, we get a good transfer effect coefficient between the half squats and the jump squats and not the, the punching. So from this, like a brief overview of this, they did their three days of training. Their half squat power output got better. Their jump squat power output got better. There is no change in bench press. Then when you look at the transfer effect going across from one to the other, we can say there was a good transfer effect coefficient between the half squat and the jump squat, but not for the bench press. So in kind of conclusion on their results, then they come up with a, a phrase or a sentence, and it's basically short-term OPL, so optimum power loading training, three times per week showed small to moderate increases uh, for the jump squat and for the or for the half squat and for the jump squat 12% and 14% increases uh, respectively but not for the bench press if we go on from those results then and we talk a small bit more about what we can kind of derive from those results and Gurf is going to talk firstly just about some scientific design and why this paper we often rag on papers we ragged fairly heavily on a paper a week or two ago um, he's briefly going to talk about why he liked this one so much. Why well, you put me on the spot now? Jesus Christ! So basically, what I like is that, for example, so we have to start with the subjects. So the high level athletes. Now, this isn't always good in a lot of cases. Not a lot of cases, but depending on the subject you're investigating, high level athletes can either be very, very useful, or high level athletes can be incredibly biased and they can really skew your results. So if we're looking at things like does uh, testosterone increase muscle mass? Um, you're coming in from a public health science view and you're like will this work for fat people and use it on 25 high level boxers and all of them again increases in muscle mass then you've gotten borderline useless results there but for something like sports science in this scenario where we're looking at will s and c work essentially on this particular type of s and c work will this have meaningful changes on athletes who've already been filtered through the training process so if we had a lot of amateur boxers we would know that s and c would eventually bring up a lot of things so the rising tide lifts all boats so any kind of amount of training will bring up things to a certain value but when you really want to see what is the most useful training i could do things like this in high level athletes are very very useful so this is very very useful for people who are looking to narrow in their training which is one of the things i do like for the, in this case these high level athletes phenomenal uh, the other thing then we had was i think the absence of sport specific training and we were just really seeing and they talked about this you can't use the transfer uh, effect coefficient calculation if you are doing the testing event in your training so the testing event in this was the punches so i really like the absence of that for a short period of time and then in general so from our point of view when we're reading papers this is a better well written better structured paper uh, now this isn't terribly important to good science but you could argue in the long run better written papers are better for the review process as we've often seen these things where people have written in literal gobbledygook in the paper to subverse the uh, journal review process and see if it got by for example the conceptual penis was one written into some of the journals it's quite funny when if you look it up um, so I, I do like that it's a better written paper. I do like that they give some of their thoughts and they reference these thoughts with other papers that support their reasoning for doing stuff. And I just get the general vibe that people who wrote this understood what was going on, wanted to see what they were gonna get, wanted to get useful results from this, I would think. Yeah. The, the main things that I really liked here are, it just gets back to kind of, harkens back to what we always say about strength training, 
and power training and why you need to become actually strong and actually powerful. So when you look at the jump squat and the half squat in particular, for boxing, these aren't specific movements. They're very general movements. Most athletes in the world will be doing them. They're not specifically pressing out, extending the elbow quickly. Um, unlike the bench press, if you were to get an alien or get a child, a 12 year old child to come down and say, do you think getting a better, faster, more powerful bench will make your punch stronger? Or will getting a more powerful half squat make your punch stronger? The 12 year old or the YouTube commenter is always going to say like the specific, uh, specific example is going to always be the best example. Whereas in fact, for most people involved in, in actually coaching, you realize that most of the time you need to make the, the organism, the athlete itself, much stronger, much kind of more uh, able to handle high forces rather than just training them in a specific direction. So that's the, the first thing we like, like to focus on here is that when you're training people or when you're coaching or training or programming yourself, you really need to look at the organism or the athlete as a whole. You don't just look at the specific range of motion they go into. If you're a golfer, you don't just think about swinging your, your hips and your shoulders from side to side. Obviously, you'd want a bigger, more powerful squat. Obviously, you'd want, like if you took a bench press example for like a thrower, you'd be saying, why is it so uh, important for a thrower to have a heavy bench press? You don't need to be thinking in terms of specific strengths and specific training. In many ways, that is as misguided as doing those kind of high power output speed work pieces during your condition when you're fatigued or trying to do lift heavy weights when you're under fatigue. It's not, it might seem like a great idea and it might seem like a valuable tool to have um, trained, but in reality, in the real world, that's just not what happens. The second thing then is, the important thing here is is like upstream and downstream effects, or that's what I kind of refer to this as. So when you look at a, a movement, if you want to break it down in terms of biomechanics overall, and you look at the power you can generate in that movement, oftentimes people get far too invested in the prime mover itself. So you will get really invested in the prime mover for, for sprinters and they're thinking about like the hip flexors for bringing their, their foot back up for their next pace. They'll think about their hamstrings, they'll think about their glutes. And then in reality, when you get a lot of sprinters and they're losing speed, they're losing speed during the, the speed maintenance phase and it's due to a lack of posture, not necessarily a lack of power output in any direction. So I think the looking at that whole scale model like we talked about in the first one, but then also looking above and below for, for where you might possibly have a weakness or where you might have a certain imbalance in that strength, this paper is a great uh, example of that. So I think the first point Fitz mentioned there, I think is one of the most interesting ones and the most new or most noteworthy for people listening to this and thinking about the concept of specificity. So for example, we've gotten a lot of questions recently in some of our live streams about people asking about like why we don't do top sets in their training and why we don't think it's a great idea. So if you think about top sets as a sports specific movement for powerlifting, think about it in the same way the punching in this is the sports specific movement for our boxers. A note, the improvement in sports specific ability in the absence of practicing that sports specific movement. I think that's the most interesting thing in this, you know. So specificity is phenomenal. It's incredibly important, but in the right times and in the right places and in the right dosage and in the right additional dosages of your supplements are all very important. But specificity in the right times, using it smartly is, is the most important thing. But without these additional preset different parts of training without your GPP, without your volume, without your lack of specificity, specificity in your training, only then can you uh, really make most use of that specificity if you organize the rest of your training very well. So I think this is very interesting that they improved these in a fashion without actually doing the punches in their week. So they notice an improvement straight away. Then the other aspect of this then I think is we've talked before about the force velocity curve and different movements positions. So for example, a maximum force movement would be a, a very, 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 very heavy deadlift. So that'd be high force and low velocity. And you wouldn't even want that to be high velocity, but then the high velocity movements would be stuff like sprinting. So they'd be very high in velocity, minimum requisition of force. So different points on the force velocity curve improve at different rates and snc coaching and snc training has a different impacts on this in varying speeds of uh outcome i suppose or varying speeds of influence so we're actually going to do a longer video on this because there's a lot to talk about this 
but the velocity one is very very interesting high speed movements can have the most um are the most susceptible to fast influences so like we talked about in the ivan video we talked about post-activation potentiation we saw how immediate that effect can be in high velocity movements and you can see in your training for example the weightlifters watching in this you can improve the speed of certain movements through smart selective assistance exercises like for example i am using more power cleans in the last two weeks and within two or three sessions i've noticed a better second pull uh, again these are degrees of improvements so you're not going to go from a very very poor starting place to quickly improving even two two or three sessions but you can improve relative to yourself so i think that's very very interesting is how fast you can have these influences I think this also highlights, for example, how high force movements then will actually have a slower impact. So I know squatting and benching are both similar movements in the gym. You would think they would have similar places on the force velocity curve, but it's, now some of this can be influenced by the boxer's prior training, but you will notice that this squat improves because we, for example, do see with weightlifters with a high power output do have higher squats. So it is kind of, it gels with what usually happens when people are training is the squat kind of does respond in some regards to power training. However, the bench then is typically something that favors a lot of high force production. So we do see then that the bench press, for example, didn't improve in this. Uh, now this again is influenced by the boxers, probably makeup and their training history has influenced their ability to bench press effectively or make adaptions to the bench press. But it does kind of highlight a little bit of uh, how certain exercises then will have less impact and or take longer to have a positive impact on higher force movements like that bench so a lot to think about in this one a lot of interesting stuff hopefully it highlights the importance of good smart s and c work on your punching power or any other power from this if you do want good s and c we recently released literally three or four weeks ago our combat sports program so 10 weeks six weeks of intensive strength training and then four weeks of power stuff so a bit more in depth than the power stuff in this but will have no less of a positive impact like we're saying in the last one we did on judo i promise you this will have a huge impact on your training we you know we don't put out stuff unless we think it's going to have a positive impact and we promise you like you see here in, in these results good s and c can have a great impact on fighters and combat sports so that'll be in the link below have it a, a little look see poos Pew, 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 pew. Thanks for watching, guys. Thanks.